lady she is. My goodness, thank you so much. Um, I might stand back up, but my reaction to the uh, CARICOM uh, reparations initiative is actually best put by Don Rojas right there in his um, article several months ago in the Nation magazine when he stated that the sheer audacity of the CARICOM 10 point program for reparatory justice in the Caribbean deserves the solidarity and moral support of justice lovers in the United States and around the world. And indeed, in the words of Sin, uh, Sir Henry Beckles in, uh, in your recent um, address before our parliament and repeated here today, the 21st century will be the century of reparatory, global reparatory uh, justice. And I love the quote that came that said that, uh, 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 that this will be the Conyers decade for reparatory uh, justice. Uh, Mama Nia was sitting there, Mama Nia Mesa, um, one of the um, long-standing uh, and COVID members and, 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 and strivers for reparations. I'm going to um, uh, uh, lift up the name of uh, Baba Henry Ferguson, who just made his transition yesterday, who, who sat by the um, was in Audubon Ballroom when Malcolm uh, X was assassinated. One of the most stalwart um, proponents of reparations. Brother Imari Obadeli, people who are in the ancestral realm uh, now, uh, Chokwe Lumumba, uh, Dorothy Lewis, Queen Mother Moore, Callie House, um, uh, and Jerry Agahani, who basically have been on this platform with John Conyers. You see, the issue of reparations for African Americans was once in the not too distant past unthinkable, Tallahassee, unthinkable by mainstream America as viable public policy. You know, many, much, much of what has been talked about today has really been buried for a very, very long time. Our history must not be buried. It must be brought out into the open. And it really reminds me of the words of Mamie Till Mobley, uh, the mother of 14-year-old Emmett Till, who in 1954 was uh, 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 battered and dismembered and this civil body was found at the bottom of Mississippi's Tallahatchie River. His mother said, I don't want to bury his memory under the rug. She said that I want to open up the casket. She said, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. And just as that casket was opened up in, 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 during that time with Mamie Till uh, Moby, today John Conyers is opening up uh, that casket of the legacy right. of enslavement, never failing year after year after year to introduce HR uh, 40, the commission to study, just to study, just to, just to study reparations proposals for African Americans. Yeah. In COBA, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, if you're an ENCOBA member, stand up or you have been involved in the reparations struggle in this country, just stand up. I saw a lot of you in you know, I mean, I'm just saying. Congress has been opening up that casket, being the coalition which spearheaded the modern day reparations movement, sparking legislatures across the country to introduce resolutions in support of HR 40, inspiring people such as Attorney D'Adria Palman Farmer to go deep on the issue of corporate involvement, Professor Charles Ogletree to initiate lawsuits in Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma for survivors. Uh, uh, Caracol, thank you. Opening up that casket, presenting this audacious 10-point program to the world, operationalizing the harms from the physical genocide, the mental genocide, the cultural genocide of our people. IBW, opening up that casket, connecting the dots between the movement for reparations in the Caribbean and the movement in the United States, and my brother, ta Coast, opening up that casket, having thrust the issue of reparations with this article in the Atlantic magazine on living room coffee tables, in doctor and dentist offices, in the mainstream media. Uh, but you know, mobilization on this issue in the United States and in the world must not be isolated to the victims of the enslavement Holocaust. My colleague there, stand up, you were introduced earlier, Katrina uh, Brown, 
uncovered evidence that her ancestors were the largest slave trading family in U.S. history. She documented her roots that they brought over 10,000 Africans to the Americas in chains. She produced a film, Sundance acclaimed film, also aired on PBS, Traces of the Train, a story from, not the deep south, oh no, but from where? From the deep north. That's if you haven't right. seen it, you must see it. She's taking a film across the country and across Europe, okay? Uh, seeking to sensitize and mobilize the perpetrators of enslavement to own up, to own up, to recognize the debt, own up to the debt, and to do the right uh, thing. And you see, it can't just be CARICOM or the UNIA or in Cobra or John Conyers or IBW or Tanahasi or Nikichi. It can't just be us saying this, okay? You see, as Katrina expressed in the Chase of the Trade, the slave trade was not just a few people taking a boat and sending it out. Everybody in the town lived off of slavery. The boat makers, the iron workers who made the shackles, the coopers who made the barrels to hold the rum, the distillers who took the molasses and sugar and made it into the rum. She said literally the whole town was dependent on the slave trade. You know, it's not, it, it, I, I can just say thank you because that's where the conversation needs to go down. That's where the diplomacy is. The, the, the information needs to be out. Wealth and privilege in the United States and in the world has been amassed in large measure as a direct or indirect consequence of the institution of slavery. Yes, I would say that CARICOM's reparations initiative has resulted in a resurgence and reinvigoration of people like myself who have been involved in the reparations movement in this country for a very long time. But almost simultaneously with the uh, a publication of Ta-Nehisi comes the case of reparations. It is now touching the hearts and minds of everybody across the country. And I just want to conclude by saying that in the context of black people in North America, the quest for reparations um, essentially constitutes four elements. Number one, the formal acknowledgement of historical wrong and an official unfettered apology. Unfettered apology, because you know there was an apology in the House and the Senate, but it came with some strings, right? It said, okay, we apologize, but you can't sue us based on that apology. So, so, you know, an official unfettered apology for the dehumanization and atrocities of the enslavement era. Number two, the recognition that the injury continued throughout the years and still manifests today. No more can you raise the legal argument of latches that, you know, it's been a long time ago and you slept on your claim and as such, you know, you can't raise, oh, no, 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 no. There is no statute of liberation of limitations or human rights um, injustices. The, 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 the compensation we owe, the debt still remains today. Number three, the commitment to redress by the federal government in the context of this country which sanctioned slavery and subsequent segregation and by corporate entities which enjoyed unjust investment derived from that area and the actual compensation in whatever form or forms it's agreed upon. In conclusion, the role that governments, corporations, industries, religious institutions, private estates and other entities played in supporting the institution of slavery and subsequent discrimination uh, directed against descendants of Africans held as slaves in the Western Hemisphere are roles that must not be ignored or swept under the rug. They must be recognized, discussed, and redressed. Such acknowledgement with repair is essential to the process of racial healing and toward the closing of a shameful era in history, onward with the Conyers decade for reparatory justice. All right.